it is recommended as level A evidence that pelvic floor physiotherapy should be the first line of treatment for chronic pelvic pain syndromes, including BPS. And that comes from that uh, European Urology Association guidelines on chronic pelvic pain. So what are we doing today? I'm going to be giving a brief introduction uh, to chronic pelvic pain syndrome and bladder pain syndrome. We will discuss uh, bladder pain syndrome. It is one of the specific pelvic pain syndrome that is commonly seen. Uh, we will look at some case studies and there will be, as Leah uh, already shared with you, some 10-15 um, minutes questions and answers at the end. So there's a, our first poll question. Are you going to do it? Yeah, I'm just about to launch. Sorry, it's a new process for me. Okay, here we go. I'm launching the first poll. Can you see that there? Yeah. Okay, great. We'll let people vote for a few seconds, but maybe Sam, you just want to read out the question and speak to it briefly? Okay, what, what is the role of pelvic floor physiotherapy in treating chronic pelvic pain syndrome and bladder pain syndrome? So mostly education as CCPS cannot be cured. Pelvic floor physiotherapists can treat chronic pelvic pain syndrome and make patients pain free. A pelvic floor physiotherapist's role is to educate, assess, treat bladder symptoms and offer strategies to help patients manage their pain. And I'm not sure. Okay, great. It looks like most people have voted. We'll give them a few more seconds and it's okay if it's not the right answer. It's just to really um, activate your prior knowledge. Okay, we've got 70% of voted. I'm going to end the poll and here are the results. Yeah, so you're very smart people. So you got the right answer. <laughs> okay, so we're going to continue on. Uh, sorry, I'm like in two screens here. Okay, so chronic pelvic pain syndrome is defined when persisting pain over six months occurs over the pelvic region with no proven pathology or infection. It is usually associated with negative sexual or emotional behavior, and the process of pain is mostly due to CNS neuromodulation. Uh, it can affect men and women. Pain perception can come from a single organ, more than one pelvic organ, or associated with systemic symptoms. If pain comes from a specific organ, you can further classify them into an organ-specific syndrome, such as bladder pain syndrome. There are other ones that are commonly seen in the clinic, such as uh, uh, prostate pain syndrome, vulva pain syndrome, vestibule pain syndrome, and dyspareunia is also another one that they like to classify uh, and dyspareunia is pain with penetration. So bladder pain syndrome, uh, it's also commonly known as interstitial cystitis or IC and pain is perceived over the bladder is worsened with bladder feeling and usually is accompanied by urinary urgency and frequency. Okay, so prevalent studies are um, ranges between 0.06% to 30%, so very large uh, discrepancy there. Uh, the recent study suggests that bladder pain syndrome is underdiagnosed and that it can affect 3.3 to 7.9 million US females over 18 years old. Uh, direct cost, uh, annual cost in the US is about $750 million. And it's female predominance. So there's two studies. Uh, well, there's a ratio, ratio of five to one in the Pacific Northwest study. Uh, European Uro Urology Guidelines talk about a 10 to 1 ratio. Uh, and in the clinic, I don't think I've ever seen a man diagnosed well with bladder pain syndrome. I've seen them with other uh, chronic pelvic pain syndrome, but not, but not really bladder pain syndrome. But they might, they might exist. So symptoms. Pain 
pressure or discomfort is related to the bladder, increasing with increased bladder content. It's located suprapubically, sometimes radiating to the groins, vagina, rectum, or sacrum. It's relieved by voiding, but soon returns. And it can be aggravated by certain types of food or drinks, such as spicy foods, alcohol, or caffeine. Visceral hyperalgia occurs. Uh, so stimuli, which is not normally perceived, is then perceived as fullness at subthreshold, and fullness is perceived as pain. So normally, uh, the stretch receptors uh, of the bladder causes detrusion contraction, so causes bladder contraction when bladder is half full. In BPS patient, the sensation of fullness is perceived earlier on. Uh, so there's, there's a detrusion contraction earlier on, and uh, pain is then perceived with increased volume. So bladder is usually overactive, and so the bladder will be contracting more often than normally. So that's why people go more often and feel they have to go more often. Other clinical presentations. So they might experience vulva or vaginal pain and sensitivity. They might have psychological distress, history of trauma, sexual dysfunction, including dyspareunia, pain with penetration. And pelvic floor muscle trigger point and dysfunction can occur. And there might be association with other disease such as fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, irritable bowel syndrome. There's a really commonly seen with those patients. Uh, depression is another one, migraine, uh, and uh, yeah, I think those are the main ones I've seen. And pelvic floor muscle dysfunction occurs in the majority of bladder pain syndrome patients, about 87% in this study, the Peters and, and all study, and mostly they are non-relaxing pelvic floor muscles. So pelvic floor muscle tenderness and trigger points may be a source of pain, and pain worsens with sustained and repeated contraction. So with this population, you don't wanna prescribe Kegel exercises as it is contraindicated. It is helpful to learn pelvic floor muscle relaxation and it can decrease muscle response to pain and eliminate pain spasm pain cycle. So for example, when there is a flare up, using pelvic floor muscle relaxation strategies can help settle the flare up or decrease the amount of time escalating pain will last. So treatment recommendations coming from the European uh, Urology Association guidelines on chronic pelvic pain is that behavioral, physical, and psychological techniques should always be considered alongside oral or invasive treatments for BPS, and apply pelvic floor muscle treatment as first-line treatment in patients with chronic pelvic pain syndrome. Another okay. poll question. <laughs> All right, let's see if I can do this one a little faster. So poll number two is coming up, and I think a few of you weren't able to vote. So if you'd like, you can always share your uh, answer in the chat and I can, I can vote on your behalf. So Sam, do you wanna just read this out for us quickly? Yes. What is the difference between physiotherapy and pelvic floor physiotherapy? Not sure, no difference as all physiotherapists have training to treat and assess the pelvic floor. Pelvic floor physiotherapists have more interest in pelvic region, therefore see more patients with pelvic pain. And none of these are correct. All right, we'll just give a few more seconds for people to vote. Looks like we have about 50% of people voting. And I apologize for the quick typos there. Those are, uh, that, that's my mistake. Okay, a few more seconds. I'm gonna end the poll now. And I'll just check that anyone has any voting in this, the chat. No, okay, here we go. I'm gonna share the results. Okay, so basically the correct answer is none of these are correct. And I'll share you what physiotherapy, okay. Oh, cool. <laughs> Computer is slow today. 
Okay, so pelvic floor physiotherapists are trained, so postgraduate courses, to perform internal pelvic examination, assess and treat pelvic floor muscle dysfunction, and help treat conditions such as pelvic pain, urinary incontinence, fecal incontinence, pelvic organ prolapse, dyspareunia, urgency, and frequency. So regular physios, they are not able to do these types of examinations. So the treatment approach for pelvic floor physiotherapy, number one is to edge education. Number two is to teach strategies to help decrease pain and flare-ups. So it's important to teach patients that the goal is to manage pain, not to eliminate pain. And three, to treat bladder symptoms and to refer because you need to think about uh, working in a multidisciplinary approach, right? Uh, as any chronic pain patients. So when we look at education, uh, usually I explain to them what chronic pain syndrome means. Uh, so they share resources with them, um, uh, refer them to chronic pain management programs, liftplanb.ca, uh, also, information on current conditions. So what is bladder pain syndrome? How can they be affected by it? Uh, what are the things they, they should be thinking about their bladder to, to, to maintain healthy bladder habits and maybe control pain that way as well? And how pelvic floor muscle dysfunction can affect bladder pain syndrome? So in, in my website, let's see if this works. Uh, there is a section there, pelvic pain, so it, it talks about it, and then it has a video about understanding pain, and it has all other links they can go to and, and, uh, and, and read more about it, because it's really important for, for them to understand that their pain is coming from, from a nervous system uh, neuromodulation rather than uh, it, you know there's something wrong with them and, and uh, they have to do more tests and all that, because that just just keeps adding to their anxiety and their anxiety will be adding to their, their pain. Uh, so the strategies to decrease, to help decrease symptoms and pain, you wanna treat lower body and muscle dysfunction. So treat the body, I treat the body holistically. Uh, is there a history of low back pain, MVA, nerve injuries? Uh, or muscles that attach to the pelvis, tones, tens, all these factors will have influence on the pelvic muscles. Sacral nerve injuries will influence bladder contraction and sphincter relaxation. Uh, and usually I give them opening exercises and stretches to kind of help the, the outside muscles to, to be more conformant and that will help the pelvic muscles to be in an environment where it's, it, they will be, have more success in relaxation. Uh, treat vulva introitus uh, uh, sensitivity. So when there is pain or sensitivity in the area close or adjacent to the pelvic muscles, pelvic floor muscle dysfunction usually occurs. Most of the time, the pelvic floor muscle will tense up. Usually, uh, important to address this first because uh, the, the bladder pain can also be referred pain from the vulva introitus sensitivity or trigger points coming from the pelvic floor muscles. And then uh, teach pelvic floor muscle relaxation and coordination. And this can help with pain, but also help to manage pain, such as flare-ups, as mentioned prior. So in the resources on my website there, uh, they can download. These are all PDFs. So diaphragmatic breathing is great exercise to help with um, decreasing uh, to relaxing pelvic floor muscles, uh, total body relaxation scripts. So I'm just going to open up one so you can see how it is. So you, you can all download that if, it's, if you think it's, it's interesting for you, important for your practice. Uh, there's some uh, opening exercises um, that I called and some lower body stretches. So this is one opening exercise and then this is another one. It's really good for starting to prep their body actually to even uh, be able to tolerate uh, 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 vaginal examination. Um, so, so to treat bladder symptoms um, for them, uh, it's 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 important to to treat the frequency and the urgency. 
Uh, so usually we use behavioral therapy for that. Um, and um, I teach scheduled urination. So teaching the bladder to be contracting at the same time, uh, a specific time. So then the bladder will calm down a little bit and it will, won't be too overactive. And then once, once they are trained to, to be contracting at the same time, then you can slowly start to increase the time between urination. Uh, there, are, there are some urge suppression techniques that will help decrease bladder contraction. So with them, I use relaxation, some, some uh, uh, distraction exercises. I don't use pelvic floor muscle contractions with them because I know that they might have tone and, and that will be an issue for them. So, you know, instead of using the pelvic floor muscle contraction to, 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 um, to relax the bladder, uh, they will use other strategies. So going up on their toes, rubbing the thighs and things like that will help bladder relaxation. And also, I, I talk to them about, about avoiding bladder irritants, such as the caffeine, uh, because caffeine will bind to the receptors in the bladder and will cause bladder contraction. So if they're already having their bladder contract all the time, you want to avoid the things that will make bladder contractions. Also, uh, diuretics, um, uh, beer, that will be like a diuretic type. And um, with diuretics, what happens is that the... the the urine will be produced much faster than normal. So then the bladder will, will have this really strong contraction because it, it will suddenly uh, stretch very fast. And then once, and then also treating pelvic floor muscle dysfunction will help treat bladder symptoms because it, you're, they're gonna be regaining pelvic floor muscle coordination and, and, and that will help with urgency and frequency, but also it will help with people that also have incontinence. And lastly, uh, of course, you want to refer. Uh, it's important to have multi-specialty and multidisciplinary approach. You want to treat holistically. Uh, you make sure to flag mental status, behavioral status, uh, red flags such as night pain, blood and urine. So you want to refer those to specialists. Very important to make sure that they are checked so, they are, so their pain is not actually coming from a disease process, but, but it's coming from a syndrome. Uh, naturopath dietitians, if they have IBS, uh, if they have issues with constipation, because constipation will actually press, put pressure on the bladder, and the bladder will be more irritable, and, and they will feel that their urgency and frequency will be worse with constipation. So, so it's treating the, the, the person holistically. Uh, so... How to refer to a pelvic floor physiotherapist? There are some public clinics in BC, uh, although you have to check with them because there, there might be um, needing specialist referrals. Uh, you want to see uh, their area, uh, what area they will take patients from, and their referral criteria and wait list. Uh, I know, for example, Jim Patterson in Surrey you need to refer them to specialists first and after they they are referred to us um, it might take 10 to 12 months for them to be able to see a pelvic floor physio so privately you can refer them there's no uh, there's no referral necessary they can actually contact the physiotherapist um, and um, and book the appointment so the best way to find us is going through uh, bcphysio.org and then you go find a physiotherapist and then you put the area where you live and then it's going to show uh, the pelvic floor physiotherapists that are in the area. Now read through their uh, bio and make sure that they are trained to doing their internal examinations and they treat bladder symptoms and all of that because that's important. Okay, so there's another poll question coming up. up. Okay, great. So poll number three. Here we go. Is this information on non-pharmacological treatment options for chronic pelvic pain and bladder pain symptoms new to you? Yes, no, somewhat. 
And maybe I can just add a few comments here too, Sam, if you don't mind while people are voting. Sure. Um, if we have time today, I'd love to show uh, some of the pain education and patient education resources that we have for Live Plan B. But thank you so much for sharing uh, your your website. We can also post some of those to ours. So just, just to put this out there, um, uh, we're just curious which which non-pharmacological or conservative treatment options are you most interested in? And if so, you can always contact me and we can have more of those types of resources on our sites for patients. So just wanted to put a little word out there to, to let me know what you're looking for. Okay, so uh, most people have voted. I'm gonna end the poll now. And here are the results. Oh, awesome. So I hope this webinar helped to increase your understanding a little bit on chronic pelvic pain and conservative treatments for, for them. Okay, so should I close this? Sorry, did uh, I? Yeah, you can. So is there a slide after this, Sam? Yeah. yeah. Okay, you can yeah. continue, yep. Yeah, so in conclusion, increasing your understanding of chronic pelvic pain uh, syndrome symptoms and classification will help treat and refer patients appropriately. As any chronic, pal chronic pain condition, it is important to have a multi-specialty approach in treatment, and pelvic floor physiotherapy can help to decrease and manage symptoms of CPPS and BPS. Uh, so now, we, now I'm gonna be discussing two case studies with you. So the first case study uh, Mrs. G, she was in her late 30s and she had history of BPS for over two years. Uh, otherwise, she was healthy. She was not taking any medications. Her average pain was about a six out of 10 over the groin area and bladder. And she had one flare up every one to two weeks and her pain escalating to about eight, eight to nine out of 10. She also had urinary frequency about more than 10 times a day, and she had pain with intercourse as well. So upon examination, she presented with decreased lower body sensibility, uh, especially hip lateral rotators and hamstrings. She had pain upon vaginal palpation. She had decreased vaginal opening, and increased resting pelvic floor muscle tone. She attended about eight, uh, she attended 11 sessions of, physio of pelvic floor physiotherapy in a, a five month period. Uh, at the end, she achieved pain free intercourse. So he, her introitus flexibility, so it's her opening flexibility uh, from a one finger opening, it went to a two fingers and a quarter opening. Um, introitus flexibility is measured as a form to measure progress and function because you want to make sure the area is ready to accept a penis and, it, and it's pain free. But also that there is room uh, for pelvic floor muscle to contract and relax, so to in, in, improve uh, pelvic floor muscle coordination. Her average pain decreased to about two out of 10. She was very happy about that. And her pelvic floor muscle contractility was slightly improved, but was still adding tension to the muscles after two pelvic floor muscle contractions. So with her, because she came, she came to see me in the public clinic, and, and I think with any chronic pelvic, any chronic pain patients, the goal is for them to be able to manage their condition independently. So they might not leave your clinic perfect, perfectly. Uh, uh, so, so I usually test their home program and see, okay, see these exercises that you're doing on a daily basis, are they managing your symptoms? Are they making sure that you have no trigger points around the area, that if you're pain-free uh, around the area, uh, in terms of, of touching and, and all of that. Uh, and you, you, and if they can, to maintain pelvic floor muscle flexibility and extensibility, because relaxation takes time to learn. It is a, uh, can be a lifelong project for them. Uh, so in this case, pelvic floor muscle training exercise um, had like a long rest in between contractions. So she wasn't doing a lot of contractions. She was mostly focusing on the relaxation and she was doing diaphragmatic breathing in between the contractions just just to maintain pelvic floor relaxation 
Okay, case two study I picked because this is a good example of um, working with a team, an inter interdisciplinary team. Uh, she, oh, okay. So this is a 39 year old female with, with mixed incontinence, dyspareunia, and bladder pain for over four years. And her pain was worsening over the past two years. So she uh, was voiding every 30 minutes, so was urinating every 30 minutes, and she leaked 15 times in three days. So we do a bladder diary with them before treatment just to see like if they have leakage and they quantify their leakage in a three day time. And then we do it again after treatment just to see if there's change in leakage. So it's an it's it's a objective measure there. Uh, she also had history of migraines and anxiety. And uh, she was taking Elmiron, which is uh, it's, it's a bladder protectant medication to treat bladder pain and discomfort. And socially, uh, she was going through separation and has a daughter with special needs. So she was going through a lot. In OB history, she had a third degree tear and she had 62 stitches with her daughter. And hence, um, why she had incontinence, but maybe uh, why she started with dyspareunia and then it maybe devolved into, it evolved into a, a bladder pain syndrome after that. So that's just the theory of mine. I, I'm, I'm not sure that's really the reason because chronic pain, sometimes there's no reason why. So upon examination, she had a grade two anterior prolapse. So basically her bladder was sitting low. So when she, um, she forced, she increased abdominal pressure, uh, the bladder will move inside the introts, but it was still inside the, the, the vaginal canal. Uh, she had actually not too bad pelvic floor muscles. So she had a strong muscle. So her strength was about a four to five. But she was, not un she was not able to maintain relaxation. So during the rest phase, she would relax, but she would just, her tone would just come up again. So she wasn't able to maintain that. And she had pain with spasms after internal examination that continued for the next 48 hours. Usually quite common to have a pain response after examination. Uh, Chronic pain patients may have this increased inflammatory response that can happen with movement or palpation if that is not part of their usual routine. And usually that response can be decreased with making those movements, palpations part of their routine. So I call it desensitization uh, exercises with them. Uh, so so um, Usually, um, I have a conversation with them and I explain, you know, you might have pain after the examination. Examination might not happen in the first, the second, or the third visit. As I was explaining to you, like you want to make sure that the whole body is ready for examination by doing those relaxation exercises, prepping the body for examination. So it takes time. And with them, everything is slow because you don't want them to have flare-ups with every, every single exercise you give to them. Um, so desensitization exercises, they, they, they usually use their fingers to start with on a daily basis, just to touch the area that they have sensitivity. So then it's kind of telling the, the nerves, uh, the sensory nerves, okay, it's okay to be touched, it's okay. So then, uh, so then when they do it, it has to be pain-free and then they continue on to be doing these desensitization exercises until they can start to tolerate more pressure, they can start to tolerate uh, uh, bigger, you know, two fingers instead of one and all of that. Um, so with intervention, first thing I did was actually refer her to our social worker in the clinic for counseling. And our social worker in the clinic also uh, teaches, uh, she has done some mindfulness classes. So she has really good um, uh, experience with uh, linking them with resources, uh, other other um, other things in the community that they can they can do. Uh, I prescribe total body relaxation with her too because it's it's a good good exercise for relaxing muscles and all that, but it's also a good exercise for pain because it slows down the nervous system. Uh, it's it's kind of a mix of of relaxation and meditation at the same time. And I did that because she was going through a lot and she had lots of anxiety and. 
And I remember in, in the clinic, I was, I was going through the motion to, with her, uh, practicing the relaxation, and she wasn't able to do that. Uh, she was very, very tense. So with practice, she got better and better. Uh, I also gave uh, the perineal stretch and introitus trigger point release and desensitization. And we were talking, like I just talked about what it is, what is that, uh, what does that mean? And once uh, introitus flexibility and sensitivity improved, uh, then she was, uh, she was able to progress that to do insertions with probes and dilators. Uh, and then um, when she was able to tolerate the probe and was pain-free, she was able to, to have the probe in there for over five minutes, then we started biofeedback sessions in the clinic. And uh, because relaxation can be very difficult to learn, uh, most of these patients have no idea what relaxation means. Biofeedback can help them develop the awareness of how it is to feel and experience relaxation. So with her, it was actually not too bad because she only needed five sessions. Usually they need more than five sessions. Uh, because she knew how to relax, her goal was actually to stay relaxed in that one minute, minute period rest. So, so she attended uh, uh, 10 sessions of physiotherapy and five sessions of counseling. Her pelvic thermos relaxation improved and her frequency improved to about one, uh, one and a half to two hours, which for them, it's a good goal. Uh, you, you know, with them, they have to find the balance between, between the frequency and the pain. So you don't want them to be extending it too long so they can start, they have more pain. So, so you want to, so two hours are, is a really good balance for them. They're very happy if they can, if they can get to two hours because they can watch a movie, they can uh, have a meeting without thinking about washroom and all of that. And my hope is that when, once they are uh, set with these exercises, this new routine and uh, learning the urge suppression techniques, they continue to move forward from that. And most of the times when I hear from them, they usually do. They, they're, they're, um, their results is not really, it just continues on because it's, it's that long process, right? Lo long process to learn this, these new strategies that they, can, they have to be adopting in their lives. She was really good adopting stress man management strategies and mindfulness to control symptoms and anxiety. And her long-term goals were achieved. So she had pain-free intercourse and she had reduced leakage episodes to two times in three days. So meaning that she had some dry days once she left the clinic. And I would say that she would probably continue to improve on those terms too. Because improving pelvic floor muscle coordination that will help the timing effect that these muscles have because pelvic floor muscles are postural muscles. So they are there for, for you. They are going to be increasing tension and activity when you're more active, when you're doing more because it's protecting the pelvis from, under, from below. Uh, but it, they also have this timing effect. So when you increase abdominal, um, abdominal pressure, the muscles will contract just before then to increase that um, tension around the urethral sphincter. So then you won't have leakage. If the muscles are tense and it's not coordinated, that timing doesn't, doesn't really work. So helping with relaxation and coordination, that timing starts to work better. So I think we are good. Um, let's see if I have something else. Oh, okay. So that's the end of the presentation. So we have about 15 minutes for questions and answers. Great. Thank you so much, Sam, for sharing those case studies. That's always so valuable for everyone. And we have a ton of questions here, so thank you so much. I'm going to start with one from Radhika. And Sam, if you like, you can look at the chat as we're going through these. So okay, um, where, I'll just... Where, can I um, just... Yeah, it might, I'm just going to read them out, but um, uh, we can still see your screen. So just hang on a second there. I'm going to read out Radhika's right now. And um, what I might do is just share my screen while we're waiting. So Radhika's question is as follows. Give me two seconds as I pull it back up here. OK. So how does, uh, Sam, can you explain how you approach pelvic floor pain and not just bladder pain syndrome? Specifically, she'd like to know pain in the pelvic floor without involvement of the bladder. 
It's very similar. Uh, the only thing that you won't be doing is the, uh, the behavioral therapy with them and, and trying to treat bladder problems if it's coming from the pain. Uh, you want to address the, the outside muscles. You want to see uh, if there's any nerve injuries, uh, their history. Uh, so then, um, you know, how long they've been experiencing the pain. Is there a reason for it? You want to see if there's an, any emotional, psychological uh, you know, background that is affecting the pain. And, and if it is, then you want to refer appropriately, right? Um, and then you want to assess the pelvic muscles and see if there's a dysfunction there. If there is a dysfunction there from the pain, you want to treat the dysfunction. And usually treating the dysfunction, it helps them kind of uh, uh, increase their awareness of how they have to be using those pelvic floor muscles. And if there is um, trigger points, you want to you address that and, uh, uh, you know, and, and treating them strategies to, 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 to help their pelvic pain. And if it's a pelvic, chronic pelvic pain syndrome, you, you know, there's more like more things you have to look at as any chronic pelvic So hopefully that answered your question. Yeah. yeah great. Thank you. Um, and feel free to, to ask some follow-ups in the chat if you like. I'm going to go to another question. And you touched on this um, in one of your case studies, but one person is asking if you ever use biofeedback to treat pelvic floor dysfunction. Yes, I do. I usually use biofeedback when there is difficulty with relaxation. I don't really use, because I find uh, learning how to, how to squeeze um, it's easier than learning how to relax. Sometimes when they're very, very weak, then I might use biofeedback for just strengthening. But relaxation is one that I use all the time. Yes, I do. Great, thank you. Um, I'll go to another question here, which is, uh, what do you consider as the best assessment process or protocol tools for people with pelvic floor pain? So that's a good question. Maybe you can talk a little bit about your um, assessment evaluation techniques or which tools you might use. Mm, I use my finger. <laughs> uh, so, so, that, so that's how I do it. I, I look at her overall body and if there's anything that might be causing uh, that dysfunction, right? So then I address that. Uh, so is there any, any instability in their pelvis? Uh, how is their SI joint? Uh, how, how is the, the glutes muscles behaving? Are they flexible? Are they very tight? How, how are they moving? How is that, their posture? Is, this will all affect it. Um, so, um, so that's kind of what I start with, is kind of the outside body and then inside body. So uh, first I will address the outer muscles in the perineum. So they, do they have trigger points? So if they have trigger points, I would try to release the trigger points even before I do internal examinations with them. And that might be treatment number one. That's all they might be able to tolerate at that point. Uh, another thing that I do with them uh, to, to help with that inflammatory response that they might have is that I, you know, if I'm doing something different to them and I, and it provoked a little bit of a flare up and pain during, during the time with me, I will end the session always with relaxation, diaphragmatic breathing, opening exercises. And I also uh, use ice over the perineum area because that helps kind of that inflammatory response to tone down. So then when they go home, they don't have a flare up. They will be uh, on for 48 hours or whatever. So then once they are tolerating that, then they're gonna be doing certain exercises to be prepping themselves for, for the examination in the future. Because you know, the, the mini, to minimize it, that, that overt reactions that they might have, especially if they're coming with uh, a history of pain with intercourse. So you know inside is act, it's actually going to be painful for them. So then I use, I use my finger, uh, I assess the outside, I see if there's any trigger point. I usually use one. Sometimes I can't even go in too far in because it's just too painful to them. And that's kind of treatment number two. And then, and then once they, they start to do those desensitization exercises at home, they come back and they, are, they can tolerate a little bit more. And so then I can continue on until I can actually assess the muscles and and see if there's any trigger points over the muscles. And if they are, then I will treat that. And so it's a process. Uh, I usually have lots of short-term goals for them. So for first short-term short goal is, uh, are they going to be tolerating examination with one finger? Yes, so that's 
so a second short-term goal? Are they going to be able to squeeze their muscles without pain? You know, so, so it goes from there. And then at, uh, as, as, uh, once they start to, to use dilators and probes, and that's when I find they are ready to start rehabbing their muscles. But it, it is a kind of a step-by-step -step thing that I do. So there are many physios that will do things differently, and it's not going to be wrong, right? Every, every physios work differently, so... Yeah, thanks Sorry. for those details. That's yeah, there's lots of approaches there. And I'm just curious too, um, which assessment tools you might use? Is there one that you find focuses more on, on function than, and, than others for this? Or if you could share a little bit about that, that would be great. So you mean like outcome measures? Oh, uh, well, if you have any questionnaires or um, if you use the uh, DN, I don't know, the BPI, for example. I use, you know, I usually mostly use the pain scales, um, and I usually try to monitor their flare-up. So uh, the one thing is, like, I usually have a goal so for them to be able to manage their flare-ups. So doing all these things, are they having less flare-ups? So I kind of calculate that, and then I also try to see if their pain level is a little bit less than before, uh, so those are the things. And then, of course, function. So dyspareunia is one, right? So if they are able to tolerate having a penis in there, right? So that's kind of a, a big one for them. And then once they can, then they can start adding movement and all of that. So I don't really have a questionnaire that I really like. I haven't find, found one that, won't, that will accomplish all at one mm -hmm. point. Uh, you're, like the incontinence ones, and then they're, they're, I usually use the, the bladder diary, and there's also the ICIQ SF score that I like because it does include a little function in there, so how much incontinence um, affects your life. So that's mm -hmm. one, and it's a really quick one to do. So that one I do recommend to kind of monitor incontinence. Okay, great. Thanks. Okay. I'm going to ask another question now. Um, we've got a few more here that are really good. So here's um, one from um, somebody who's asking about courses you'd recommend. So this person works in chronic pain, and she does see a lot of pelvic pain uh, patients. Having a few more skills would be really helpful. So she's just wondering what, what uh, courses or professional development might, might you recommend. So she's a pelvic floor physiotherapist? I believe this person is a, a physiotherapist, but with a, a, a lot of chronic pain patients. Okay. Uh, I would say probably understanding pain, chronic pain would be a good one. Um, I don't know if she wants to move into this, is this area, then she can do the, the pelvic floor uh, uh, courses level one and level two. The level two they teach chronic, uh, they teach more pain. Level one is teaching more incontinence. Uh, and there are some, uh, so there's so many courses out there. It's hard to, to kind of comment on, on all of them. I like to take courses also that addresses the emotional state because I find um, working in this area for, for some time, especially working with chronic pain patients, it's, it's very hard on you. And you have to be emotionally sound to treat these patients because you might be able to absorb a lot from them. And, and, and that kind of, uh, you know, after a while, uh, listening to their stories. And another thing that happens to chronic pelvic, um, to pelvic floor physiotherapists too, is that you might be eliciting their traumatic, traumatic response, right, in the in the past. So they, they had a trauma uh, history and then uh, they say, no, this was, I've been, I've been dealt with. There's no problem. It's been so long ago. There's no problem. I can, I can tolerate examination. And then you touch them and they just melt down in tears and, and you feel so awful because you feel like you're producing that, that experience on, on, on them all over again. So, so working with chronic pain patients, especially in this area, I would definitely recommend some type of emotional support uh, class or, or have a network that you can talk to and debrief these situations with people and all that. Yeah, thanks for those suggestions. And um, this respondent is also suggesting that a few of the courses on the um, PABC website, yes. so the Physiotherapy Association, they, she's just curious which ones you'd recommend, but maybe we can answer that one offline. But thanks for bringing that up too. Okay. Um, so I have a few more questions here. One is from another physiotherapist asking about uh, 
your acupuncture and which points specifically you might use. So maybe you can address that a bit, Sam, too, because I think it's, it's, mm-hmm. uh, it's a rare combination and, and I think that's quite unique. Yes. Um, acupuncture with chronic pelvic pain patients, you have to be very careful because they might uh, want to have acupuncture for the rest of their lives because it does help with pain. But with chronic pelvic pain patients, you want to make sure that they are managing their pain independently. However, if they have frequency and urgency, I sometimes use acupuncture to help with that. And um, there is uh, there is a protocol that I try to use in the clinic. And there's some points that I usually think it helps with um, urgency and frequency. Uh, I know um, because we are physiotherapists practicing acupuncture, we, we're not TCM practitioners. There is a question in um, if, if what you're using, it's actually within your scope of practice. So I would say what I've been using, it's within my scope of practice because I'm a pelvic floor physio and I treat a lot of dysfunction. Does that make sense? But if you are uh, if you work in orthopedic, you might not be able to use those points to treat a lot of dysfunction. You might use those points to treat the nerve injuries or to to facilitate tibial nerve innervation that will help decrease bladder contractions and all that. But uh, so in terms of points, I usually use Plin 6. I use uh, Bladder 32, which is the, the innervation to the bladder uh, and the sphincter. Um, I use uh, some relaxation points. Um, now, if they come with back pain and the back pain is affecting their muscles, I will treat the back pain with acupuncture, right? But I try to really narrow the population down which are going to be appropriate for acupuncture because sometimes they are not sometimes i want them to do the process so they can have a home program and they can have it they can be independent with the home program okay great does that answer thank you it? Sam. i yeah. think so yeah it's a little beyond me but i'm sure our audience is finding that very useful uh, okay. we have someone here asking about scar tissue mm-hmm. uh, going to read the question out. So how do you address scar tissue and what resources do you give your patients to help them to help themselves for scar tissue related pain? Yeah, so you can palpate scar tissue from the inside. It's um it feels like a little um it feels like uh like a string that's not really smooth, uh, that doesn't really uh, move in, in, in the in the skin and in the part of the vagina where they might have had the tearing. Uh, so if I palpate that, then I try to release it. So there's some massages I can do to release that. Uh, usually they need more than just one treatment for that. Uh, if they are okay, um, usually I find patients, they don't really have the palpation skills. So sometimes it's hard for them to feel the scar tissue, but if they can feel the scar tissue, or if they're doing desensitization exercises using their finger, they can, uh, they can try to do massages that are, um, perpendicular to to the scarring or uh, just circular motions on the daily basis just like any other scar in your body right when you when you when they when they go for surgery usually prescribe them scar massage so that's usually what I do there are some uh, movements uh, that I find that helps like some muscle energy techniques that I'm like I'm having my finger in there and then I I do some muscle energy techniques with their hips if it's close to the uh, to the external uh, hip rotator um, part inside so so then I will just just do a little bit gentle movement and then move the scar a little bit but yeah so that's how you address okay thanks I'm gonna ask a few more um, really specific questions here and then I might take a few minutes just to show um, some pain BC resources uh, this last question is asking about prolapse of the bladder or the uterus do physios work internally in the rectum or can it help with hemorrhoids Mm, hemorrhoids no um yes we do internals uh, anal examinations and vaginal examinations anal examinations we we uh, we can't see really the prolapse from the anus we usually uh, uh assess through the vagina and it's just how you um you position your fingers so then you can feel the interior part moving or the posterior part moving so the posterior part moving you know it's coming from the rectum hemorrhoids no uh we don't treat hemorrhoids. Uh, they have to or take medication or go and see a surgeon. Uh, you know, most of the times hemorrhoids are not surgically sound. They don't like it because it can come back. Now, one thing we can do is 
treat and is teach them techniques that will prevent them from having the hemorrhoids because it's all those bearing down techniques that they want to avoid, especially if they all also have prolapse. Uh, so there's, um, you know, little tips that I give them, how to have a, a bowel movement without straining, how to position yourself, uh, activities they have to avoid because that will increase the prolapse, the chances and, and you know, the hemorrhoids and all 